just pray. Gracious Lord, how thankful we are for what Jesus accomplished for us. That in his innocence, he protected those of us who are guilty. And even in the midst of our guilt, because of what Jesus has accomplished, we have been set free. Grant us your presence and your spirit, not only this night, but every night and every day, with reminders of your innocence, our guilt, and the freedom we have received because of your action. And now may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you and to you alone, for you are our Redeemer. Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ who was, who is, and who will always be. This is the last evening of our Places of the Passion. We've been in Jerusalem and then we were in Bethany as Jesus had his feet washed. Then we were on the Mount of Olives, and from the Mount of Olives, then we went to Gethsemane. After Gethsemane, it was down to Caiaphas' palace, and now we're at Pilate's judgment hall. And each step of the way, we're in the midst of following in Jesus' steps where he went for you and for me. The last week of his life was full, absolutely full. And we spread it out in so many different ways. When I was growing up, we had Palm Sunday, and it was actually Palm Sunday. That's all we talked about on Palm Sunday. And now we have Palm slash Passion Sunday. Because we have to get in the passion before Easter. When I was growing up, we were all in church. Every night we were to be in church. So tonight, we'll hone in on one part of that Passion Week, and that's the trial. I don't know if you think about trials much. What was the greatest trial over the last century? It could have been the Stokes Monkey Trial. Remember that in Tennessee? That was lauded as one of the greatest trials, and it was from that point that we talked about evolution in school. Or maybe it's when Nazi Germany fell and there was the Nuremberg trial that took place for the atrocities of the Nazi party. Or maybe it was the O.J. Simpson trial. We all remember that, right? The Bronco riding down the center of the road. Or the glove that, of course, he could have gotten on, but he didn't. Or maybe it's Timothy McVeigh, for those of us here in Denver, maybe you remember when his trial for the bombing, where he killed 168 people in Oklahoma City, his trial was downtown at the Federal Building, right across from Holy Ghost Catholic Church. And in fact, the night that his judgment came down, or the day, my church in Parker was feeding meals to the people who had lost their families. I don't know what trial stands out to you, but the biggest trial of all time for us is the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. We know why he was there. He was there because the hierarchy, the chief priests and the scribes were jealous and were envious. In every trial, whether it's the trial of Jesus or these other trials or any trial, there are three words that will stand out to anyone. They want to hear the word innocent, right? If you're the one who has been brought before trial, you want to hear the word innocent. You certainly don't want to hear the word guilt, but that's another word that could rise up. And for the people who are there because of the victims, guilt is what they want to hear. And then there's another word, which is freedom. Three words. Innocence, guilt, or freedom. 
when we look at what happened this night, those are words that began to fall as well. Pilate actually pursued the word innocent for Jesus. What has he done? His wife is after him, right? We read that, for Pilate knew that it was out of envy that the Sanhedrin had developed and delivered Jesus up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered much because of him in a dream. A little bit about Pilate, he could have cared less, we thought. He was not known to be a nice man. He was mean. He would incite terrible events. He had no problem crucifying people. And yet for some reason where Jesus was concerned, there was a struggle that happened for him. Maybe deep down he understood that this one held something much different than the others. So what do they do? They bring Barabbas forward. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer. He had no love lost for Rome. Jesus was one who talked about peace and kindness and justice. Barabbas just would kill anyone. You would have thought that Pilate, of all people, would have wanted Barabbas put to death. And he brings him forward twice in the trial before the people. You know, we always talk about with, with those who are shouting from, from the uh, praetorium for Jesus' death. Oftentimes we talk about Palm Sunday where the people lauded Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem. And, and we think it's the same people oftentimes that were standing in the praetorium who were now yelling death to Jesus, but it really wasn't. The Galileans came from the outside, and so they were most likely camped around the outside of Jerusalem, outside the city walls. The Judeans were the ones who were there shouting, buying into what the Sanhedrin had wanted, crying for Jesus to be crucified, crying, saying that he was one who was found guilty. It's a struggle, isn't it? Innocence? You and I know that Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing. In fact, Pilate knew Jesus was innocent of any wrongdoing. Barabbas, we knew he was guilty, right? They knew he was an insurrectionist. They knew he was a murderer. They knew he was full of guilt. Us? We're as guilty as him. We may have those moments of innocence in our lives, but in reality, we too deserve guilt. Jesus? What sprung forth out of him? Even when they took him in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, Jesus, knowing they were coming to get him, took his hand and healed the ear of the high priest's slave. Is that guilt? Is that insurrection? Is that murder? No. So as Jesus is brought before Pilate, to be flogged, to be battered, to be beaten, to have crown of thorns placed on his head roughly so that it would stick into his brow, a mark of guilt. Was Jesus really deserving of that? You know, he was innocent. I know he was innocent. Barabbas knew he was innocent. Pilate knew 
he was innocent. Caiaphas knew he was innocent. Guilt. Caiaphas was guilty. Judas was guilty. Peter was guilty. Pilate was guilty. You, me, filled with guilt as well. Are we not? So when we think about the, the judgment hall, Pilate's area, Pilate's willingness to be a part of this, even if he didn't want to, we need to picture ourselves there. We're prone to wander, aren't we? Luke says we're lost. Like the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. We're blinded by the God of this age, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians or in Ephesians. We're hopeless. I love this from Philippians. Paul says, our finest deeds, they're just dung. A rubbish or manure. Because we can never be at the standard that Jesus is. We find ourselves caught in this guilt that just continually perpetuates because we are caught in sin. Paul writes, what a wretched man I am in Romans. Not, I was a wretch. No, he says, I am a wretch. The same man who hoped we would all be like him. Actually, he would hope that we would all be like Jesus. And in reality, we fall short. So on that day in the Praetorium, what happens is instead of Jesus being marked as the innocent one, he is called guilty. And in his guilt, as the scapegoat, he's taken to the cross. And what happens as all of our sin is poured upon him in his guilt is we become innocent. Is that crazy or what? We become innocent because he is the scapegoat carrying our sins upon him. In the Old Testament, oftentimes what they would do if they didn't sacrifice the lamb or didn't sacrifice the goat, sometimes they would have a service where they would lay a ritual, they'd lay all of their sins on this goat and send it out into the desert to die. Taking all of the sins out into the desert. And in essence, that's what happens with Jesus. All of our guilt switches from us to him so that you can be called free. Free from what holds you. Free from that which is controlling us. Free from that which pulls us down. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, like you, I once was lost, in the words of Luke, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Innocence. Jesus. Guilt, Barabbas, Pilate, Caiaphas, you, me. And Jesus takes our place so that you and I can be free. That's what happened in the Praetorium. In Pilate's Hall, just for you, just for me, for everyone that is listening and for those who never will listen. 
the innocent one dies so that we might be free. And let us pray. Oh God, in the midst of the week ahead, we ask that you would walk in and through us. That you would remind us that you carry our sins, our guilt. And in your innocence, you died for us. Grant us, O oh God, your peace. Grant us, O oh Lord, your freedom. And move within us. 